Hello, I'm Fujian Zain, and welcome to the Inner Voice Show, where we explore all that matters to you from a psychological perspective. Today, Dr. Michael Yapko, a clinical psychologist and a marriage and family therapist, is joining us. Dr. Michael Yapko is internationally recognized for his work in clinical application of hypnosis, treating depression, and developing strate strategic outcome-focused psychotherapies. To date, he has been in, um, invited to present his ideas and methods to colleagues in 29 countries across six continents and all over the United States. He is a recipient of the Milton Erickson Lifetime Achievement Award, twice a recipient of Arthur Shapiro Award for the best book of the year on hypnosis, from the Society for Clinical and Experimental Hypnosis for Treating Depression with Hypnosis, and from Pierre Janet Award for Clinical Excellence from the International Society of Hypnosis, a Lifetime Achievement Award, honoring his many contributions to the field. Dr. Yapko is the author of numerous books. Some of these include Breaking the Patterns of Depression, Trans Work, Treating Depression with Hypnosis, Hand Me Down Blues, and Depression is Contagious. Welcome, Dr. Yapko. It is a joy to have you on my show. Thanks very much, Pooja. Um, I have um, known you for a while, and I um, was honored to be able to be uh, a student of you for 100 hours of hypnosis training, which was excellent. And um, to me, uh, a lot of people who are watch watching, a lot of um, the, our listeners have heard about hypnosis. And I know that for many, many years, the conversation about hypnosis and depression didn't even come in the same sentence. And people said you couldn't treat uh, hypno depression with hypnosis. I know that you have done almost 40 years, 30, 40 years of exp uh, uh, exploration about depression and your experience about hypnosis. So can you tell us a little bit about, uh, one, why did you get um, excited about hypnosis and um, studying about that? And then how it translated into treating depression via hypnosis. Okay, well, it's a pretty big question. I'll try and scale it down. Um, the first thing that I think people really should appreciate is that what hypnosis is about is about focus. It's about your quality of attention. And it's about how people develop particular beliefs, how people develop particular perspectives about the way that they look at things. And so when you are a clinician as I am and you study the different kinds of problems that people experience. Depression is the most common mood disorder on the planet. I think you're in clinical practice for about five minutes before you see your first depressed client. And anybody who treats people who are suffering depression immediately becomes aware of how often people have beliefs that aren't really true, self-limiting beliefs, negative beliefs about themselves or about the world around them, how they form conclusions about experiences that aren't very realistic at all. And so for me, it was a challenge. How can I help these people who are suffering because of the things that they believe and the way that they think about things how can I help them start to get focused on and help them get absorbed in other ways of thinking about their experience, in ways that wouldn't be depressing to them, in ways that would open up new possibilities and positive possibilities to turn their lives around and start to see what's right in life, what's possible in life, what the strengths are that they have instead of just focusing on their weaknesses looking around the world and seeing what's right with the world instead of only focusing on what's wrong. And so from that perspective, hypnosis became a very valuable tool for helping people start to focus their attention and start to pay attention to things that they really never paid attention to before. So 
So in that respect, I'm using hypnosis as a focusing tool and as a way of introducing new ideas and new possibilities to people that can have a pretty big impact on the way that they look at themselves and look at the world around them. So that, that's how the blending of the two came together. What was really uh, fascinating to me, and I learned a lot from you, especially not only in the world of hypnosis, but in a particular way that you distinguish, and I think the word you use is discriminate, um, between the thoughts, such as a lot of people when they're depressed, one of the main um, concepts that they go into is they generalize one episode or one thing that has happened in their life and they generalize it to all areas or that they become very hopeless about the future that they envision um, and not necessarily looking at the strengths that they might have and one element of powerlessness that they've experienced with one episode or a couple of episodes, they take that as the full fact reality and they hold on to it. Um, one of the ways that I've seen you work, which I haven't seen with a lot of other psychotherapists, is this key um, and masterful way that you actually come in and distinguish things. I remember my own experience with you as I sat and um, you were doing this uh, hypnosis on me and it was about how come I um, eat uh, in a way that <clears throat> I think I should just be able to eat whatever I want and I shouldn't get any consequences. And um, you asked me and how do you come into this uh, thought process? How did you formulate this thought process that you could do this uh, and no consequences when in other areas of your life you know that that's clear. That's the first time I had been uh, faced with this type of question where I had to look at and ultimately it almost like brought me from a child worldview into a, who I should have been which is an adult worldview. Um, so t tell me a little bit and tell our audience a little bit about the way that you distinguish, discriminate uh, a person's thought process in that way? Well, let me, uh, it's a great question and it's a great example. Uh, uh, you know, let's, let's start with a general comment first. Part of the problem is when people think things and then they make the mistake of actually believing themselves. The problem, of course, is that the way that we think, we as human beings, we are processing information and we're not computers. We're not logical about things. We're not necessarily entirely rational about things. We have the ability to distort information if it serves our interest to do so. We have the ability to conveniently ignore things that we really don't want to pay attention to. And it's this process of, of information processing that becomes a primary target, I think, of any therapeutic intervention. You know, people don't want to have anxiety. They don't want to have depression. They don't want to have weight problems. They don't want to have any of these kinds of things going on. They just do what they do. But part of the limitation of the, the, of the way that we process information is we're prone to taking one example or two examples of something and then thinking that that represents the whole thing. So that somebody asks a woman out, she turns him down, and, and instead of saying, she turned me down, he says, women won't go out with me. Now, I have to be able to ask a very logical question. Does this one woman represent all women on the planet. And of course, you know, that's when people realize the, that they've made an overgeneralization. Then we can start to get much more specific about how do you know who to ask out? How do you know when to ask someone out? How do you know what the right way is to ask someone out? And now we start moving into the realm of making better skills, using better skills to make better decisions. But when people make these overgeneralizations, what they don't do is distinguish. So it, it's, a, again, another a, a common example. Somebody's boyfriend cheated on her, 
and that relationship broke up, and then she gets into a relationship with a new boyfriend, and she starts checking his phone and checking his messages, and she starts treating him as if he's the last guy. And I'm the one that has to point out this new guy is not the last guy. But those are the kinds of overgeneralizations. So instead of saying this guy did something bad, the overgeneralization is you can't trust men. Well, you know, there are men who cannot be trusted. And there are men who can be trusted. But if you have a global belief that you can't trust men, then you'll never learn how to recognize the men who can be trusted. So that's how I start using therapy to teach the skills of discrimination. How can you learn to identify the exceptions so that you don't believe your own rules, particularly when your own rules work against you, when they keep you lonely or when they keep you paranoid? I want to be able to point out that there are a lot of really good people in the world and there are a lot of really bad people in the world and your job is to learn how to tell who's who so that you can surround yourself with the people who are good and have a nice life. Now for um, a person who might um, come in um, in their own head and say uh, generalize like you just said uh, this is the way everybody is or this is how I am or this is how I'm going to be um, would you recommend um, for them to take on this type of questioning on themselves such as asking themselves well how do I come up with that um, and I'm sure that uh, the another, another part of us says well because of this 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 that's how I come up with it and if um, we were going to give a couple of sentences to support uh, a person going through some healthy dialogue with themselves, what would you recommend? Well, for, first of all, most people don't go because of this, 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 and this. Most people say, I believe it's true because it's how I feel. And they, they mistake their feelings for the truth. So it is one of the most valuable skills that people can learn to engage in a process known as reality testing. How can I go beyond my feelings? How can I go outside myself in order to find out whether what I think is really true or to find out whether what I believe is really true? But when people are brushing up or encountering their own self-limitations, I can't go back to school because I'm not a good learner. Or I, I can't apply for a better job because I don't think I deserve one. Or I don't think I can ask this person out because I don't think anybody's ever going to be interested in me. That's when people have to go out of their way to do what they think they can't do. You know, the, the only way that you ever learn is through experiences. And to seek out experiences that contradict what you believe to be true is how people change. You know, in, the, in the same way that if, if someone was going to write a book, let's say, how important it is to have people read the book who you know are going to disagree with you instead of just letting people read the book that you know are going to agree with you and tell you what you already believe. What, what makes it a growth-oriented experience is can you find a way to respond to the things that challenge you, the things that contradict you, so that your view of yourself, your view of the world gets bigger and bigger instead of your view of yourself and your view of the world getting smaller and smaller. So as soon as somebody says, I can't, that's when you really should go out of your way to try. But to try intelligently, that you don't set yourself up for failure. You know, be, before you go try, you learn something from the people who have done it and who have done it successfully, and how have they done it successfully, and what did they do differently than you have done, and what are the skills that they bring to it that you would need to develop so that you can succeed too. But, uh, you know, it, it's important that people be willing to try, but they also have to be willing to try intelligently. You can't just do something and hope that it works. Um, 
When we're looking at depression in, uh, in an individual base um, is one thing. And I know that, for example, because our viewers are a Persian population, I know that in Iranians, uh, depression um, is pretty high, um, especially in Iran. And uh, some of the statistics that we've got from Iran is that the women, the percentage of women being depressed is uh, almost six times as men. I know in the United States it's twice as men, but in different countries are different. Um, but there's also this piece of a societal depression almost, like you might be able to look at things and discriminate and work through some of your own concepts, but then, then we have the whole family ha being depressed, then we have our neighbors being depressed, then we have almost the whole society coming into some sort of a, like, kind of like a learned helplessness depression in a sense. And what would you suggest to someone who really wants to kick out of this or um, they are part of this whole, you know, learn helplessness concept of depression and then yet there's a part of them that really wants to do something for themselves in order to kick, them, kick themselves out of this space and then yet might feel that uh, they're feeling like they're coming back into it and being pressured right back into it because the environment doesn't even allow you not to be or it's um, if you are not depressed uh, or at least behave as you're depressed that you are shallow and you're not deep and you're not you know you're not part of the compassionate uh, perspective of what the suffering is around the world what would your suggestion be well, there's a, a couple of really good points that you're making, you know, and let me draw attention to them. You know, the, the first is that depression really is contagious, not in a viral sense or a bacterial sense, but in a social sense. That so much of what we learn as we study depression around the world is that it is different from country to country, culture to culture, even from demographic group to demographic group, as you pointed out correctly, women have a much higher rate of depression than men do. And you know, part of the problem is that people who are prone to depression typically make one fundamental error. Uh, that is that they blame themselves for it. It really helps to know, is this about the culture? Is this about the society? Is this about the political structure in which I'm living, or the social structure in which I'm living, or the fan structure in which I'm living, or is this really about me? If you understand that this isn't about you, you're fine, but the things that you want to do are not going to be encouraged by the people around you, that the things that you want are not going to be supported by the culture in which you live, at least you can understand this isn't about you, this is about, about the culture around you. And it gives you a very different target that instead of blaming yourself and feeling like you're weak and feeling like there's something wrong with you and feeling like you're trapped, it gives you a target outside yourself. It gives you a freedom to fight for. And the reality is that nobody is going to hand you freedom. Everybody has ideas about how you should live, what you should do, how you should spend your time, how you should spend your money, who you should have sex with, how you should dress, who you should vote for. You know, the, the world is filled with people who would love to take over your life. And the, the challenge is how you maintain a sense of independence about who you are and what you're willing to take in as a message from the world around you and actually believe versus what you come to understand is that these are the beliefs of my culture, but I don't have to believe them. These may be the beliefs, the political beliefs of people around me, but I don't have to believe that. And it doesn't mean you have to tell everybody that you disagree and get into fights all the time, but it means you get to protect yourself and your own way of looking at things from having to question yourself and, and discourage yourself and, and depress yourself with thinking that there's something wrong with you for feeling the way that you feel or looking at things the way that you look at things. You know, if you look at the world around you, not just in Iran, but in how many cultures around the world do you have people that are fighting for their freedom? And it's at a very huge cost how many lives are being lost every single day, 
and think it's not just political, it's about people who are sex traffickers and people who are drug traffickers and, you know, all, all the people out there who are willing to hurt people and take away people's freedoms for their own personal gain. So that's what it looks like in a broad, broad way. But when you bring it down to the individual level, the single most important thing is to be able to question that, that even though the people around me seem to believe this or seem to think that, do I have to? Do I have to buy into that? Do I have to, do I have to agree with that and internalize that? And what happens when I don't? What happens when I discover I don't feel the same way as other people? And instead of that being a basis for self-criticism, I'm hoping it's a basis of strength for people. Um, Michael, when we're talking about the aspect of um, uh, the freedom of choice which is inside, when we're looking at, um, for example, letting go of, um, let me say it another way, as I was hearing you, um, and correct me if I'm not saying it accurate, but if, as I was hearing you, it's like we fall into a sort of a certainty or a rigidity in, in ourselves. And a lot of this kind of certainty and rigidity uh, pulls us down and takes us into the depressive world. Um, whether we generalize it or take on some belief system or our feeling says something which is negative and then we put a lot of weight on it and we become very rigid and say this is the way it is. And as I hear you saying that... Or, or people say that's just the way I am. That's just the way you know, I that, am. That, that, that's the rigidity. That's just the way I am. I have bad genes or it's because I come from this family, or it's because I'm this gender, or it's because, you know, pe people who, who, who use that self-definition as a way of limiting their own options. Now, if we um, look at this type of rigidity or certainty that we hold and have, you know, get to because we need some sort of a safety and security, and then, therefore, in order to get out of this and have a healthier life, we need to question, question the way we think, question the way we um, behave, question the way we feel, question uh, some of the aspects of maybe the culture or the society and all uh, aspects around us in order to get us out of that rigidity. And then as a byproduct of it, I'm, I've all, you know, with the 25 years of being a therapist, I've also saw um, the, the uncertainty and not having a structure and consistently questioning it also creates some sort of like an existential anxiety about not having any structure to move forward. So how do we balance the two where we're, you know, balance between the certainty and certainty, balance between this not falling to a rigid concept and then having some structure that holds us and yet even the structure can be more fluid than the rigid. Any ideas, please? Sure, yeah, the, the idea of course is striving to develop enough self-awareness to be able to say, here are my values, here are my preferences. You know, it, 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 as an example, I'm, I'm a simple metaphor. It's like a cup of coffee. You might say, I prefer to drink my coffee black. And somebody else says to you, how can you do that? Don't you know coffee should be had with cream and sugar? And they say it as if it's a fact instead of a preference. Well, it's important for you to be able to say, I know myself well enough to say, here's what I like, here's what I prefer, here are the conditions under which I do best. Where people need the flexibility is when they adopt a perspective that works against them. When you're adopting perspectives about yourself that enhance you, you know, that to, to be able to say, I care about people, so I would rather be a doctor or a nurse than a computer programmer, that's great self-awareness to be able to say, here's what I value, I want to make a contribution to people's lives. On the other hand, if you say, I'll never be happy unless I'm a doctor, now it's become pretty rigid, pretty self-limiting, if you discover that you can't get into a medical school or can't 
succeed in, in medical school. Not everybody is cut out to be a doctor. But you could still say, all right, maybe I'm not going to be a doctor, but I, there are other ways of still contributing to people's lives and let me be more flexible and let me use my values of wanting to make a contribution in other ways. But that's that's get lost is they, they say, I want to be a doctor, and then they can't be for some reason, and then they feel like their whole life is a waste. Mm -hmm. That's the rigidity. So you want certainty about aspects of yourself. You want to know yourself well enough to say, here are my strengths, here are my vulnerabilities, here's what's right with me, here's what I do well. Here are the, here's what my values are that tell me, here's what my life can be about. And then using that to be able to handle the uncertainty of, so what am I going to do today that's going to give me a chance to express those feelings or express those values? How am I going to respond to this difficult challenge in a way that's still going to allow me to grow and still going to allow me to like who I am and like what I do? You know, that's the self-esteem part of this, the self-image part of this. You can't control the world around you. You can't control how other people are going to see you or how other people are going to react. It's like doing this interview. I can give people information. I can give people perspective, but that doesn't mean they're going to agree with me, and it doesn't mean they're going to like me. I'm creating the possibility that they might find something valuable in what I say, but I can't make somebody say, wow, that was the most important conversation I've ever heard, even though I would love for some people to react that way. I can't control it. All I can do is create the possibility by being available, by giving information, by having information and statistics about the things that we've been studying, what clinical experience I can share, and then after that, it's not up to me anymore. Up to, after that, it's up to the viewer to decide for themselves what any of this is worth. So um, it's almost like looking at what I have control over, what I can't, what I uh, and the area that I can't control, let it be the area that I can do something about, uh, kind of question how I came about believing that, how is it that I'm doing this, question the feelings there, that are coming up. Yeah. Go ahead. There's, there's the discrimination because one of the, you know, when you talked about depression earlier, you were talking about helplessness. Well, there is where somebody forms the conclusion, the global conclusion, that when being hurt, there's nothing I can do about it. They're not discriminating what do I have control over, what don't I have control over. They're globally giving up. And it becomes one of the most important skills to learn to know where is that line in any given situation that helps me determine how much control I have and how much control I don't have. And this is easier said than done. You know, I, in, in my depression workshops, one of the exercises that I do with a large room full of therapists, people who are well-educated, people who are experienced clinically, I give them a number of scenarios, a number of case vignettes, and then I'll ask them to make the judgment, how much control do you think this person has over the circumstances that they're in? Write your answer down. And it is astonishing how in a room full of therapists, how very far apart the answers are. That some people will listen to the case and they think, oh, this person's got total control over changing that. And another person listening to the exact same case goes, oh, this person should give up because there's nothing they can do about it. And if educated and experienced therapists have a hard time knowing what's controllable, you can understand why the average person would have a difficult time making that discrimination. But that's why it becomes such an important skill to develop. You don't want to give up when there are things that you can do to help yourself and the flip side you don't want to keep trying when it's out of your control. I mean, it's one of the great skills in life, too, is to know when to walk away from something. But you don't want to walk away unrealistically, nor do you want to try unrealistically. So it helps to have really good judgment about when do you hang in there and keep trying, and when do you walk away and say, enough. And is that when uh, you actually do some reality check with yourself? 
uh, because it's sure. like, how do I judge? How do I know that I'm making the accurate judgment? How does it that I can come to gain that skill of doing that kind of a discrimination in the way that I think and feel? Well, here, here's an easy example. So often where people get stuck is in their relationships with other people. They think they're going to be able to make their partner care about something that they care about. They think they're going to make their kid want to be a doctor or want to be a whatever. They think they can make somebody be different. Now, here, here's an easy discrimination. As soon as you're in a relationship with another human being, you are only 50% of that relationship. You're not in control. You can't make people care about the things that you care about. You can't make people feel the things that you feel. You can introduce possibilities, but you can't make people do things. And, and that becomes one of the most common themes of therapy. You know, the, the wife who thinks she can change her husband if she just works at it hard enough. You know, the, the husband who thinks that he can make his wife care about sports if he keeps pushing her hard enough, or whatever it happens to be. You know, the, the parents who think they can make their kid want to go to college. And, you know, the, as soon as you're dealing with another human being who has an independent mind, you can negotiate with them, but you can't control them. Now, in uh, your book, Depression is Contagious, which is uh, one of the books that you have actually um, written for public. I mean, most of your books, a lot of your books are geared toward teaching the therapist many right. of the methods right. and your ideology. But Depression is Contagious is actually written for public and I really, really recommend that This is one of the greatest books that I've ever read for self-help book that people can really get these ideas. Um, since depression is contagious, when a member of the family um, is depressed, it affects everybody else in the family. Now, since we're talking about uh, the freedom, freedom from the self perspective, how do you suppose and suggest uh, for a person who feels stuck in a relationship, whether that person is their mate, their parents, their children, um, their grandparents, somebody is in their family which is very important to them and that's not like, okay, it's my friend so I'm going to leave, but it's a someone who suppose that you choose to stay and um, they're depressed. And how do you free yourself from this environment? And what do you do with their depression when it's kind of encompassing and it is contagious in the whole space? Well, the, the first thing is you have to know your own boundaries. You have to know your own limits. You know, and, and you know as, as a psychologist yourself that this is one of the toughest things about being a mental health professional. What happens when you want more for your patients than they want for themselves? You know, it's, it's one of the most obvious traps to avoid. I don't want to be the, the person who wants more for this person's life than they want for themselves. So I, I have to know where the boundary is of how far I can go in wanting to help how much I can do. But you know, when I'm dealing with family and, and family members, it's easy for me because even the most depressed people want something different. They want to feel better. They want something. You know, when you ask a teenager, what do you want? They'll say, I just want my parents to leave me alone. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about what you can do that will make that happen. You know, that, that what, what happens when you're making better choices and then they feel like they don't have to watch you so closely? You're the one that's, that's getting them on your back. You're the one that can get them off your back. But my point is, in a family, it starts with, here's this depressed person. I'm not responsible for them. I'm not the one making their choices for them. I'm not the one that, that is causing their depression or maintaining their depression. But I can certainly help them define what they want for themselves. I can certainly offer them support in getting the things that they want for themselves. I can help them not feel so isolated. I can help them feel supported. I can let them know that I care about them, but also offer them the realistic perspective, no matter how much I love you, if you break your leg, you're still the one that has to wear the cast. 
I can't wear it for you. And so I'll support you. I'll help you do the things that you need to do to help yourself. But I'm not going to do it for you. I'm not going to take your life over. I'm not going to assume responsibility for you. You're still going to have to be responsible for yourself. Now, if that means I'll help you by going to a therapist with you because you won't go by yourself, then I'll do that. If it means I'll sit here and read sections of a self-help book to you because you won't read it by yourself, then I'll do that. So I'm, I'm willing to go the extra distance at, at first. You know, I'm, I don't expect to still be doing this a month from now or three months from now. But if it helps you to start to build some momentum of starting to improve things and starting to take responsibility for your life, I'm willing to help. I'm willing to go out of my way. I'm willing to do extra to get you started and to get you clear that by expending effort, things can change, things can improve. And, of course, motivation is directly tied to expectation. The reason people give up is they don't, is they don't believe that effort's going to pay off. I have to give them a glimpse of what it's going to look like when effort pays off. So it's, uh, again, the, the, the judgment, the discrimination of uh, what I have control, what I can't, what is it that I can do for their boundaries, and <clears throat> moving forward with all of the pieces that I can do in order to motivate them and um, uh, create a space that at least they can choose to walk into whatever they're choosing to do, and that's the piece that I can do. Uh, Michael, very, very interesting concept, uh, which is the area of your expertise um, in psychology, in human behavior, in distinguishing between, um, you know, how people do things and the way that you are so um, detailed oriented in your observation um, has also taken you to a whole uh, different experience, which you were asked to observe um, uh, particular elephants. Can you talk about that? Because that's fascinating and how that has given you and the field of psychology for humans actually, um, you know, some gifts. Well, this was an amazing experience I had. You know, I, I've spent my entire professional life studying people who do things well in order to have a better understanding of what actions people take what thought processes people go through when they're facing challenges and manage them successfully. But, but I've always been focused on psychotherapy. I've always been focused on human growth and specifically on helping people bounce back from depression, studying people who have overcome depression and what they did to do that and all those kinds of things. So you can imagine my surprise when one day I get a phone call I think most people have heard of the world-famous San Diego Zoo. Well, San Diego has a sister park also run by the Zoological Society. It's called the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. And whereas the zoo is 100 acres of beautiful, beautiful display, the Safari Park is 2,300 acres. It's huge. And it's where they engage in breeding animals that are highly endangered. So one day, out of nowhere, I get a phone call from the safari park. The general manager says, hi, my name is Jim, and I'm calling you from the safari park. And we currently have 23 elephants. We want to establish a breeding herd of 120 elephants wow. because elephants are highly endangered. They're being poached for their ivory. They are being killed because they are expanding uh, into human territory and humans find them a pest and kill them. And so elephants are highly endangered. And I'm listening to all this, trying to get a word in as he's talking. <laughs> And finally, he takes a breath, and I say, look, you're talking to me about elephants. I'm a psychologist. You must have a wrong number. He says, no, no, the reason I'm calling is if we're going to establish a breeding herd of 120 elephants, we're going to need many new trainers, many new keepers, and handling elephants is very dangerous. 
elephant trainers get injured, they get killed routinely around the world, and we are going to have to hire many more people, and we want them to be safe. So we have a man who's in charge of the elephant program. He is brilliant with the elephants, but when you ask him, how do you do what you do, he says, I don't know, I just do it. So he's, your skills in being able to figure out how people do things is very important to us right now. We would like you to study this man, figure out how he does what he does so well with the elephants, and help develop the training program for all the new trainers and keepers. So instantly, my head is just swimming with, he wants me to come work with elephants, and he wants me to expose myself to the dangers that they're trying to protect the keepers from. How can I do this? How can I not do this? I'm an elephant, I'm, I'm an animal person. I love animals, and I think they know that. And the opportunity to work with elephants is totally unique. I've never done anything like that. So I said I'd be thrilled to do this, and I did. So I spent the next three years awesome. learning more about elephants and elephant management than any psychologist you're likely to meet in your lifetime. And we did, in fact, develop a great training protocol and developed the training programs. And what we did in San Diego now has been picked up by other zoos around the world, a fact that I'm really proud of, how we have made a big difference in how conservation of elephants and protection of elephants is done these days. Uh, it's been a lasting contribution, but it all came out of the work that I do with people, trying to understand how people do things well and bringing those skills to different aspects of life, how to build better relationships, how to build better businesses, how to build better self-esteem, how to build better problem-solving capabilities, how to do all these things, because it really is all about how you do what you do, what you focus on, what you tell yourself, how you approach things that determines your quality of life. Thank you so much. Um, it's been a great gift to know you. I've learned so much from you, and I keep on learning. Uh, we were just at the Evolution of uh, Psychotherapy Conference, and um, you know, you're an amazing speaker and uh, the detailed and the particular way that you look at things and you teach things are just amazing. So thank you for uh, the opportunity that you gave me for me to share you actually with our audience. Thank you so much, Fujian. It was a pleasure talking with you. Take good care and thank you so Thanks. much for being with us and I'll see you again next week. Goodbye. A pleasure.